So we're not, we don't have yet a satellite constellation that is survivable. Now they're talking about doing that in Space Force. One of the things I was part of back in 2016 was, was coordinating with the Trump campaign and then initially the Trump In the eyes of Brandon Weikert, author of Winning Space, How America Remains a Superpower and an expert in military technologies, what lessons can the United States learn from the Ukrainian-Russian war? In this episode, Mr. Weikert and I talk about technological competition and supply chain security in strategically important technologies in the context of the threat from the Chinese Communist Party. We also talk about the significance of Russia's deployment of a hypersonic missile on Ukraine and how the United States, in his view, may be falling behind in latent industrial capacity in the new quasi-war with the Eurasian authoritarian bloc. Mr. Brandon Weicker, wonderful to have you back on our show today. Thanks for having me. So I want to start us off with an article you published two years ago uh, in August 2020 on the national interest titled World War III may be closer than you think. Uh, in which you warned about the threat of hypersonic weapons from Russia and China, and how there is some sort of an objective deficiency within the United States industrial capacity um, to counter these threats. Over the past weekend, the news came out that Russia fired a hypersonic missile at Ukraine. This is also the first time in history that Moscow had used this type of weapon in combat. How do you gauge the significance of this? Well, uh, thanks for bringing up that great article that I wrote. It, it, it made quite an impact at the time. Uh, and it, I think the conclusions I made are more relevant today than they were even back then. Uh, and toward that end, we see now Russia in particular, but also remember China, uh, as well as North Korea now, as of January of this year, all have working uh, hypersonic weapons. Uh, and Russia over this last weekend, as you know, uh, for the first time that we know of, that we can confirm, because there were reports they were using similar hypersonic systems in Syria over the last decade, but we know for a fact that they used a hypersonic um, a missile against NATO targets or against a resupply uh, uh, area in uh, Lviv, Ukraine. Uh, which represents a significant escalation on the part of Moscow. Uh, and um, we are not able to defend against those attacks as evidenced by the fact that the attack was successful. Uh, I know for a fact that U.S. air defense systems are not able to uh, adequately defend against those systems. And what's more, the Americans themselves and our allies presently do not have our own hypersonic weapons arsenal in the way that Russia, China, and now possibly North Korea have, which creates a significant strategic imbalance and actually could potentially upend any kind of deterrence that exists between between the United States and Russia uh, and could potentially lead to an uncontrolled escalation on the part of Russia. And uh, what are the capacities, uh, I believe from, from what I read online, is uh, the fractional orbital bombardment system. Uh, could you comment on the, the capacity for, for Russian forces to be able to do this and the impact of, of this? Well, it's also known as FOBs, which is its um, its its acronym, uh, Fractional Orbital Bombardment System. So if you look it up, you'll probably see FOBs a lot, too. Um, basically, this is a technology that both the United States and the former Soviet Union experimented with throughout the last half of the Cold War. Uh, this is not necessarily new technology. The issue is deployment, uh, development and deployment. So we did a lot of research in the West on the system, but never actually, as far as anybody can tell, and, and I have a lot of interaction with our military, and I've never really heard or seen it displayed, uh, the fractional orbital bombardment system we've never actually built. So there's no real world working version of it that we know of in the, in the public. Um, the Russians with these hypersonic weapons, that is a form of a fractional orbital bombardment system. And so the concern now is that Russia and China have the real world capability to put these systems in orbit and threaten any position on Earth. Now, it's, it should be noted, the weapon system that was used in Lviv over the weekend, Ukraine, uh, by the Russians was a smaller variant, more like a cruise missile type. Um, but China in particular, but Russia certainly as well, has larger versions that are capable of orbiting the Earth indefinitely and then descending like a banshee uh, over any target in uh, on the world, in the world. And so the concern now is that China and Russia both uh, have the ability and the willpower to send these systems into orbit and to deploy them at will 
in the event of a crisis such as the one we are currently being made to endure courtesy of Mr. Putin's desire to take Ukraine. And we saw, I guess, the strategic importance of satellites, um, you know, as we go along in the combat in, in Ukraine. And on a similar note, um, you commented in uh, your, your book on space war for winning, winning space that um, it is crucially important that American, that America secures this aspect of warfare and technological advantage. Uh, can you comment a little bit more on this? The first thing I'd like to say is that um, as it relates to hypersonic or nuclear, conventional intercontinental ballistic missile, you know, nuclear missiles, um, the United States must have immediately a space-based missile defense system. Um, the uh, military, our military knows that presently our current air defense network is not capable of stopping an incoming hypersonic attack. Uh, we also obviously don't have the ability to counter strike in hypersonics, not yet at least, as a place where we can possibly intercept uh, these hypersonic or just conventional nuclear missiles as they come in to American airspace. We don't want to have to intercept them when they're already in the atmosphere. We want to get them when they're still in space. This is the basis of Ronald Reagan's Strategic Defense Initiative, otherwise known as Star Wars. Uh, we need it now more than ever, and we do have the technological means today to do that but we haven't had the political will or economic resources. And so when we're talking about hypersonic attack or ICBM nuclear attacks, we have to talk about space as being integral to that. And we need the sensors up there to track these systems when they launch and to follow them through on their, on their trajectory. And then we also need the sort of mid range or we need the mid course interception uh, capabilities, neither of which we've, we've got. Um, and then as it relates to the satellite question, obviously the satellites are critical uh, for everything the United States military does around the world. Uh, the satellites are the critical linkages that allow for American power projection to occur almost instantaneously from mainland United States to any position on the earth within 24 to 48 hours. And if those satellites fall under attack, and they are already starting to be targeted, by the way, uh, if those by the Russians in this case, if those satellites fall under attack and their systems are disrupted or disabled or for destroyed, um, we now have degraded capabilities. And that's the whole objective of the Russians and Chinese uh, creating what's known as counter space capabilities, the ability to deny the Americans access to the critical strategic high ground of space during a crisis such as, again, the one that we're going through in Ukraine, but also potentially over Taiwan eventually uh, at some point in the deck in the next decade. So we're not we don't have yet a satellite constellation that is survivable. Now, they're talking about doing that in Space Force. One of the things I was part of back in 2016 was was coordinating with the Trump campaign and then initially the Trump administration about making some of those systems survivable, but ultimately um, th they've not gotten to where they need to get to with, with that. SpaceX has helped with their Starlink network, for instance, which is a, a, an attempt to bring the internet to parts of the world that have no infrastructure for hosting the internet. These satellites would basically beam the internet down into these hard to get to places. But there's also a strategic value as we're seeing uh, SpaceX sent about 40 Starlink systems over for Ukraine to use. And this basically prevented the Russians at the early stages of their invasion of Ukraine from completely cutting off and isolating Ukraine from the worldwide telecommunications network. And so Starlink is providing a template for the United States to over the next few years, hopefully do a kind of a crash course, if you'll pardon the expression, uh, in surging our own survivable, smaller, cheaper, easier to replace, maybe less complex, but easier to replace uh, satellite systems that will allow for us to a, stay in a fight longer and B, make it more difficult for the Chinese and or Russians to deliver a knockout strike on our, our vital yet vulnerable uh, satellite constellations, but it's still slow going. Right, and we definitely saw that the strategic importance of these communication networks, uh, you know, we can tell from the first air missile strikes that Russia, uh, you know, exported on Ukraine was targeting communication systems. So. Re with regards to that, uh, on the on a similar note, they hit the news today that Elon Musk's uh, business ties with China are kind of raising eyebrows in Washington. 
um, presumably after seeing the strategic potential of their, as you mentioned, SpaceX satellites in actual combat in Ukraine. Uh, do you see this as an issue? So um, two years ago in November 2020, um, Elon Musk made a comment that got people kind of rankled in Washington, D.C., in which he basically said if SpaceX or when SpaceX manages to colonize Mars, the potential colonies will not be governed according to American law. The United States government will have zero jurisdiction there. It will be governed either according to international law like Antarctica is, or it will be governed to by, according to the whims of SpaceX corporate management. Um, and understandably, that got the DOD, the U.S. Defense Department, very con concerned because SpaceX is a hugely subsidized entity by the U.S. taxpayer. It receives a lot of government contracts. It provides a lot of services for us, but it is paid by you and I as American taxpayers. So a lot of people in Washington looking at sort of this issue from a strategic standpoint saying SpaceX is one of the few companies we can rely on in a pinch to get us out of a bad situation in space. Um, we don't want to have them where they think they can run the show. And then you tack on uh, the, the concern that especially Tesla, which is Elon Musk's other company, the electric vehicle company, has a lot of connectivity to Beijing and to China in terms of their business interests. They have a lot of exposure there, a lot of ties. Um, the concern is that uh, Elon Musk could A, go rogue over time, or B, that he's just going to be co-opted like every other Western firm uh, by China's growing interest in uh, the high-tech industry uh, across the board. And so one of the things I did was I initially consulted, um, not a supporter of Mr. Biden. Uh, they reached out to me. They're looking for multiple inputs from different space experts. I was one of them. And in February of last year, they really wanted to know, you know, ostensibly who owns space, but basically um, what could they do uh, to kind of force Elon Musk to play by the, the rules. And what I told them was, while I too was concerned about some of his comments, at the end of the day, we've done such a bad job of resourcing NASA and, re and supporting other innovative space startup firms that could compete and do similar things that SpaceX does. Because we've done such a bad job of doing that, we've put ourselves in a position where we have no choice but to rely on one company in this case, SpaceX. And I said that you know, while I would love for us to have options, unfortunately, with the Chinese breathing down our necks in the space race and now with Russia doing their their escalation militarily in space uh, as part of the Ukraine invasion, we don't have the option of looking elsewhere. So my advice would be we're going to have to grin and bear it with uh, with with uh, Elon Musk. He hasn't really done anything bad to us yet. Uh, he does seem to be pretty committed to, to working with the U.S. government and trying to uh, do the right thing. And there's yet to be any instance of SpaceX doing significant business dealings with Beijing. So until we start, you know, figuring out how to isolate SpaceX away from doing business overseas with Beijing um, or until we can help prop up other competitors to SpaceX, we're kind of stuck between uh, SpaceX and the bad guys. And so we're going to have to rely on them for now. Something we might want to do, and I've talked about this with Rand Paul's people uh, back in 2019, uh, we need to start registering um, tech transfers, critical tech transfers from Western firms to Chinese entities as um, illicit bribes under the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. And that alone should put a stop to like 80% of these, these really bad tech transfers that Western firms do with China in order to gain access to that, um, that billion person market. You do that and suddenly companies like SpaceX, you've raised the risk to them and they probably won't really risk doing greater business and Tesla as well uh, in China because they're going to get dinged significantly and possibly prosecuted uh, by the US government. That's true. Uh, there's something about like, the policy part I want to get to a little bit later. Uh, let's talk about uh, if I have a question whether the innovation aspect, right? Because you talked about a lot about this in your book that um, the innovative capabilities of the United States is somewhat deteriorating, or as at least not uh, great as it should be. Uh, can you can you elaborate a little bit on this across maybe not only the space industry but also the you know military technologies as well? 
Absolutely. And the two, of course, are linked, right? I mean, uh, you know, our military, and this is something James Mattis was trying to tell former President Obama back in 2010 when Mattis was the CENTCOM commander, is that if you don't have a strong and robust economy in the United States, our military strength doesn't exist. It's all built on that. It's built on the foundation of U.S. economic dominance and, and competitiveness. Uh, so, uh, as I mentioned also in that that uh, article that you you referenced at the beginning, the World War III article about a draft being possible, um, I referenced the latent industrial capability or lack thereof in the United States today. And, and as you note rightly, I've spent a lot of time in my, my writing since then explaining how the United States was able to win the Second World War. It was not just because we were so star-spangled awesome, although we were. It was because after Pearl Harbor, we had latent industrial capacity in mainland United States where we could become the arsenal of democracy and completely outproduce our enemies in the Axis powers. Today, should a space Pearl ha Harbor happen, which I think it is coming, or a cyber Pearl Harbor happen, which I think it is coming very, very soon, um, even if we decided to say, hey, Russia, China, you picked a fight with us. Now we're coming for you the way we came for Japan and Nazi Germany and fascist Italy. Unfortunately, we don't have that latent industrial cap capacity any longer. We have outsourced for 50 years almost that capability to China and elsewhere. Uh, and so now when the attack happens, we will not have that ability to surge production and then strike back with that the new production that we've enjoyed. Uh, that we've created. Uh, similarly, innovation. So we've taken for granted our um, standing as the world superpower made in large part by our dominance in the previous industrial revolution. But what people don't seem to understand is that beginning in the 1990s, really with the rise of Newt Gingrich's uh, Congress, for instance, and I'm a big supporter of the 94 Republican revolution, but one of the downsides was the Republicans started urging, and Clinton went along with this, cutting federal research and development support at the precisely same moment that the People's Republic of China was beginning to take all that money they made from becoming the workshop or the sweatshop of the world and reinvesting that money into high-tech R&D and into uh, STEM, science, technology, engineering, math, education for their young people at that time. So you had at that time China surging uh, their, innovate, their investment into innovation, R&D, the next industrial revolution at the precise moment that the United States was not building off of their dominance, but was instead standing down as part of the peace dividend because we wanted to let the private sector do everything based on the faulty notion that the private sector can do it all on its own. We never recognize, for instance, that the previous digital and computing revolution, the telecommunications revolution that happened from the 1940s all the way until the 1990s was all brought about in part, in, in part by the uh, public sector by tax funding for uh, new technologies that uh, things like the telecommunications uh, uh, industry, uh, things like uh, the computer revolution came out of DARPA. Came, it was that moment Mariana Mazzucato talks about in her book, The Entrepreneurial State. It was that moment when John Maynard Keynes reached out and shook hands with uh, Adam Smith to create new technologies that ultimately delivered both prosperity for private sector, but also national security advantages for the public sector. We stopped that marriage. We, we divorced that in the 90s. And ever since then, we've sort of drifted. We've had some really wild innovation with apps and sort of new iPhone features. But in terms of the big strategic you know, things that the, the, the Apollo programs, the, you know, uh, new nuclear fusion technology, uh, quantum internet, quantum computing, um, we have sort of stuttered on that and sputtered along. Uh, and the Chinese, meanwhile, are catching up to us in these critical areas and are starting to leapfrog us, which will have significant strategic implications over the long run. Whoever gets their first wins, basically. And so that one of the problems is we've not funded and had sort of a national political and strategic uh, policy for coordinating the strategic needs for innovation and, and high tech R&D with the private sector's ability to innovate and to get, garner profit. We, we've stopped doing that the way we did back in the 40s to the 60s. And, and now we're falling behind our rivals. So if, if a strike were to happen and would require us to surge capacity, not only could we not 
massively outproduce our foes in China or even possibly Russia. But we would also then have the, the problem where our, our technology that is a real force multiplier for us is no longer as advanced as it once was or dependable. Right. And you kind of talked about um, the, the legislation part of it, which I kind of wanted to go to next. Um, there, are, there are a couple of co bills in Congress right now that, that, you know, that aims to bolster American competitiveness in these strategically uh, important technologies, um, you know, from, from, for example, the perspective of supply chain security. Uh, do you see this as a start to something that can bolster American competitiveness in these areas? And do, do you think uh, it's lacking in um, some any areas? So um, the first thing is, this is very heartening to see, finally, uh, it would appear enough members of both political parties are on board with trying to make America more self-sufficient. We really had a wake-up, or we should have had a wake-up call when China unleashed the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic upon the world, um, and we saw the brittle supply chains really start to fall apart with relative ease. Um, we've still never fully recovered from that, by the way. And furthermore, now with this Ukraine crisis disrupting even more, we, we're going to have problems going on probably till 2024, 2025 with supply chain issues. The problem is we're trying to um, kind of go local, if you will, with supply chains at a time when we're already to the, what the military would say, we're already to the right of boom, right? The crisis has already hit what long ago, 2020, uh, and we're kind of slowly reacting and it's all sort of piecemeal and at the margins. What we should have had was a real, like full-throated bipartisan total commitment to restoring the domestic supply chains or at the very least to bringing those supply chains f closer to home out of Asia, in some cases out of China in particular, and much closer to home Home, but we, we're still kind of at the margins there nibbling about. My big concern, and this was illustrated in Peter Schweitzer's excellent new book, and it's something that I've been saying for years, my big concern is that so much of America's political elite has been captured by Chinese interests, both parties, over the last 50 years, that you know we'll have no problem sending Russia back into the economic because we're not as connected to them as, as, as we are to China. But when it comes to trying to do something similar to China, or even trying to just diversify our supply chain investments out of China, and even to say Mexico, um, it's very difficult to do that at the level you would need to do that for that to have immediate impacts. And that's because I think uh, our business and political elite and our media elite, for the most part, are completely owned by uh, Beijing on some level, and they're hesitant to do much of anything beyond virtue signal. Um, so while I think this is great that we're finally doing this, we need to A, recognize that it's nowhere near enough, and I don't know if we're going to be able to do enough anytime soon because of the elite capture I was talking about, and also there's a real fear to kind of rock the boat, if you will. Um, you know, our business elite, our entire economy, we talked for decades about the concept of Chimerica, the marriage of China and America economically, that, that fusion. Um, under Trump, we started to try to sort of unravel that. We never really could. And certainly one of the reasons we couldn't is because there was some real economic hardship for people who were being directly impacted by those tariffs and those protectionist measures Trump was doing, notably farmers. And so, um, you know, we have to deal with the fact that our people are going to feel a lot of pain immediately if we start really going hot and heavy uh, with these tariffs. And so the question is, do our elites, if they're not totally captured, do they have the ability to withstand that? pain and that pressure? And do our people have the willpower to sort of deal with the inconveniences that will arise in the near term for when we really need to rip that Band-Aid off? And I don't know if we are, and I don't know if we do. Already the Biden administration is talking to Beijing at the behest of people like Richard N. Haas and the Council on Foreign Relations about basically triangulating with Beijing to screw uh, Russia over, which sounds great on paper, but it's, 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 the, it's again an example of how our neoliberal liberal and neoconservative elites like the bourbons of old of old have uh, learned nothing and forgotten nothing of their previous bad policies. In this case, triangulating with China against the Soviet Union. Yeah, it helped to defeat the Soviet Union in the Cold War, but we ended up making a Frankenstein's monster in the Chinese Communist Party. And we're at risk of doing that yet again uh, because of this this war in uh, Ukraine between Russia and Ukraine. So 
I guess you're suggesting that maybe instead of playing the China card against Russia, uh, why don't we play, utilize this crisis sort of thing to, uh, perhaps what we should do is try to leverage this to somehow decouple from China. Do, do you think that's yeah. a like, possible uh, path that we could take? That's a preferable path on paper. Again, um, there's going to be a lot of fallout from that. Um, you know, it, it's easy for me to sit in my my well air conditioned office at home and say this. But the question is, and we saw this with the Trump trade war over soybeans and agricultural goods, uh, American farmers were disproportionately harmed by uh, by those tariffs because of their big client was China. And Trump was saying, hey, guys, you can't you can't sell to China anymore, at least not at market prices. It's going to be more expensive. They're going to have to, you're going to lose that client. A lot of farmers went out of business. A lot of homes were put into foreclosure that were farms. Uh, and that actually, before COVID came along, started threatening Trump's political fortune, uh, which is one of the reasons I think he was so gung-ho about getting a deal with Xi Jinping. Um, and so we're going to have to deal with the fact that we are so enmeshed with China that when we do start seriously trying to decouple we're going to have to pay the price, both literally and metaphorically, uh, in the near term. Now, in the long term, I think we'll be OK. I think we would figure it out. But in that near term, and our society is so short sighted about these things, you know, I don't know if we could actually follow through the way we would need to to make such a very significant and severe policy work. I would hope we could. And maybe if we're in sort of a new, you know, war situation, which we kind of are right now, I mean, there's no going back to the pre-2020 world. It's not happening. Uh, so maybe the longer these crises go on, Americans will start saying, hey, you know what, we've got to go local. We've got to stick to our, ourselves a little bit more in terms of economics and supply chain. And maybe that'll slowly over the next eight to 10 years, we'll see it. But if there's any desire to see this happening in the near term, I'm very skeptical. And again, with the Biden administration, you have a bunch of engagers with China, despite their rhetoric in public. They want to engage with China. They want to use China to contain Russia and hurt Russia. And also you've got John Kerry in the background who has a lot of power in this administration and influence. John Kerry wants to use China uh, to get the mother of all Green New Deal signed, uh, you know, wants to not just restore the Paris Climate Accord, but to go beyond that. And in order to do that, Mr. Kerry thinks he's got to have China on America's side and he's willing to push the president to make any concession necessary to save Mother Earth from the evil polluters. And so, uh, you know, we, we have a bunch of engagers. And so I just don't know if we're going to be able to do the right thing in this case, not at least in a while. So I guess the enemy in the way is actually, I think if I recall correctly, that you say in your book, the zero sum thinking um, that, that, that American elites are holding right now, that's the real kind of, that type of thinking is the real national security threat, so to say. Yeah, our biggest threat is our own leaders because most of these people, and it's not even that they're necessarily evil, it's that they, they are a lot of them of a certain age group, uh, I don't want to sound ageist here, but they're of a certain age group and they all came up in a very different world. Their, their formative years were a very different geopolitical and economic situation and social situation in this country. And so all of their years of experience um, are reflective of a time that has now long passed. And so all of their solutions, many of them, most of them are simply not applicable any longer. Uh, it's ironic that a baby boomer, you know, a septuagenarian like Donald Trump was actually starting to try to implement policies and entertain ideas that were not really commensurate with his generation's you know, preferences or experiences, but he was the outlier. Uh, most people that are running the country and I and both parties, um, they, they're not connected to the to the real situation going on in the world. Um, you know, like I said, 2020 was the beginning of a, of a very scary new world. Uh, and we need leaders who understand that. And we don't have many of them in office right now. And therefore, we're going to keep finding ourselves in these really interminable crises because our leaders have helped to put us into these crises. And so the idea that we're going to expect them to be able to dig ourselves out of it with them at the helm is a little crazy. And yet we keep finding ourselves being led by the people who got us into the mess to begin with. And they make it worse. Who, fit, who knew? Right. So we've been talking a lot about China's uh, sort of strength and threat. Uh, 
on the other side of the coin, uh, do you see any of China's weaknesses that the United States, at, as of now, can leverage to um, get an upper hand in this somewhat you call a new Cold War or Cold War 2.0? Well, actually, it's more like a quasi war. Um, you know, there's I, I made the mistake of briefing uh, two the two senior commanders back in 2019 at U.S. Cybercom. And I said, well, this is the new Cold War. And the, the general, he said, he goes, Cold War. He goes, son, he goes, my guys and I are in combat every day we go into the office. This isn't a Cold War. This is a hot war to us. And so, you know, I now I say I, I have to be careful. Now I say it's a more of a quasi war. Um, but, but the bottom line is, is that, uh, the United States is not equipped, I think for, uh, living in that sort of condition because we don't have leaders who fully understand the strategies of that. What we need to be doing is making ourselves more self-sufficient and, our leaders don't want to do that because it's going to hurt their wallets. It's going to affect them economically. It's going to hurt the country economically in the near term. And so unfortunately, until we are in a condition where everybody recognizes there's no going back to pre-2020 and we really need radical new solutions, we're going to keep finding ourselves in this position where we're constantly dependent on China, uh, which is only getting stronger with every year. Now, the, the issue of can China sustain and get even stronger than they are now. You've got one camp that says they're just getting going, and that's certainly a possibility. You have another group that says, hey, look, China's got some downside risks they're going to be rubbing up against. We already see that with the Evergrande crisis earlier, you know, about eight, six months ago, uh, in which their real estate market is collapsing. I am not as sanguine that that's the beginning of the end of China, or that rather China's going to collapse anytime soon. But I do fully acknowledge that like Russia, China's got a lot of problems they're going to be facing, particularly in the next seven to 10 years. They have the possibility of getting old before they get truly rich. They have issues with fertility in that country. They have a very severe demographic imbalance between ma uh, male and female because of the three generations or two generations of one child policy that was imposed by the Chinese Communist Party. Um, but there's also opportunity, that means, uh, and adaptation. The thing to understand about China even more so than Russia, is that the Chinese leadership is keenly aware of many of the, the data points that indicate potential decline and collapse of the regime in the near to medium term future. So the Chinese leadership are making bold, I would say, uh, executing bold strategies to try to stave off that collapse. Um, and this is why you have, for instance, now a big push in northern China is to marry off those excess men uh, to the excess female population of uh, Russia's Far East. And not only now are you ameliorating the problem of having too many young unmarried men in China, but you're now also helping to potentially fuse Russian and Chinese power over the long term by creating family and blood ties between the two countries. This is something that's being actively encouraged by officials in Heilongjiang. I, excuse me, I, I never said that right. Uh, Heilongjiang province, I think, uh, uh, you know, these northern by the Amur River, uh, these northern provincial leadership of the Chinese Communist Party are encouraging young men to marry young Russian women or to marry young uh, uh, Turkic women uh, that are that that are uh, in in Western China, and so you you have you know these sort of you would you would think in the Western context very bizarre policies, but this is China's leadership saying, hey, we recognize we have downside risks, and we're trying to 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 implement policies and strategies to avoid that, so the Americans can't beat us. Uh, the Evergrande crisis. My friend David Goldman, who's also my editor at the Asia Times. His theory is that the Evergrande collapse of the, the, the largest real estate investment firm in China uh, was actually engineered by the Chinese Communist Party, knowing full well it would have short-term negative impacts on China's economy, but in the long run might avoid a bigger crash of a Lehman Brothers size uh, that we experienced in our real estate market in 2008. Uh, and so the Chinese are trying to stave off an economic collapse by sort of preemptively triggering a collapse in their real estate market, which is their largest market uh, in their economy, and forcing uh, investors to, to reinvest the money that would have gone into uh, risky real estate ventures into high-tech research and development that not only will uh, benefit 
uh, the country by making China potentially the, the sort of driver of the next industrial revolution, but would also yield long-term strategic advantages to the People's Liberation Army by making China the driver of those high-tech investments. Now, whether or not that happens, we don't know. This is still too early to tell. But yes, China has significant, significant problems, but China is actively trying to address those problems. So the question now is, what can the United States do to exacerbate those complications uh, for China's long-term dominance or prospects of dominance? And what are we doing? And the bigger issue here is, I don't see us doing much to exacerbate and complicate Beijing's life based on the weaknesses that everybody knows China has going forward. So... um... You know, one thing that I read read in your book that I was really fascinated with was the depth that you went into um, from historical perspectives of China and how it manifests itself in recent days. Um, And this can be off the record if if you like, but what do you think? So China before it tried to, you know, it had an, the culture itself had an expansionist tendency, like the, you're right, and the culture itself actually, I think it's in a form of, um, like there were warfares and everything else, but it isn't as, say, aggressive or as menace as perhaps more of the Leninist driven culture today. Right. Um, that's been on my mind probably, you know, since I've started going in, into the, the journalist business. Can you maybe give us your perspective on the, if there are any differences from what it used to be before to this somewhat of a mixture more like the Marxist Leninism kind of ursipped the traditional aspect of the culture and took its form, but instead the actual substance is different. I don't know if this this is making sense to you. No, it is. It is. And we can do this on the record. I don't mind. The thing about Chinese culture that I've, one of the reasons I studied it is because I was very fascinated by its ability over four or 5,000 years now to survive and thrive despite you know, history of being conquered at times and and dominated by foreign powers. Um, But somehow the Chinese remained ultimately the final winners of all those conflicts. What they were very good at was absorbing new ideas and people into the wider construct of Chinese civilization. Um, And so what they did with Marxist Leninism was they absorbed a very Western idea and they incorporated it into the larger Chinese civilizational construct. And since that time have been able to sort of take traditional Chinese objectives and preferences and fuse or marry them to these very revolutionary, radical, aggressive, violent, uh, repressive, uh, expansionistic Marxist Leninist ideas. And now what you have today is a very terrible noxious, scary fusion of sort of this this very long ancient civilization that has a history of success over thousands of years um, being driven by these very ideological, particularly Xi Jinping, very uh, ideological expansionistic uh, leaders with delusions, let's face it, delusions of grandeur. And um, and then you marry that to China's size. You marry that to the fact that they're the second largest economy in GDP terms and that they're probably at this rate by the middle of the century. The IMF says no later than 2027. They will be the number one economy in GDP terms. You look at all of that and you think this is a very significant menace. And now that for 40 years, China has built up their domestic economy into a high tech major economy, basically going in 40 or 50 years from a giant version of uh, North Korea into a dynamo, a, a, an economic dynamo. Um, now that they have that economic undergirding married to this very revolutionary expansionistic political ideology, nursed by historical grievances perceived or you know, real, um, they now have that economic power that they can then reinvest into becoming a real military threat. 
And that's precisely the phase that they're in, in China, is now taking all that money and wealth and building out a war machine. And you're seeing that now uh, with the increase recently, I think it's a 7% increase in, in their defense spending. Uh, you see this now in the expansion of their nuclear weapons arsenal, which used to be very covert, now is very overt. You see this now in the expansion of their Navy. Across the board, uh, China is now taking all that money and wealth and latent industrial capability, and they're surging forward to eventually, by the middle to end of this decade, be able to truly challenge the United States militarily, at least west of Hawaii. Uh, and, um, you know, so you see the growth of China's civilization and the ability to incorporate new concepts, new ideas, and how that doesn't fundamentally change what China's trying to be doing, China has been trying to do, which is to expand from a collection of huts along the Yellow River 5,000 years ago into the dominant, you know, global middle kingdom. Um, it's just unfortunate that the current dynasty ruling China is the Communist Party uh, because they're a vicious group of people uh, who are not going to leave their neighbors alone and who won't even be satisfied, by the way, with tributaries as previous uh, d- dynasties were. They're going to want to have complete dominance and thought control, total surveillance. It will be a very invasive sort of relationship uh, compared to previous dynasties that had kind of the global or, or regional dominance. And from just last question, from the ideological perspective, um, you know, I, I always feel like the communism has this tendency to, um, you know, I, I can probably say this tendency to dehumanize, um, you know, people from their traits. And, you know, as it kind of urged of China's uh, right uh, traditional aspect of the culture, it also took away almost, let's say, the essence of, of this culture, um, you know, by by doing what what it what it just uh, what I just described. Uh, how do you how do you see this uh, perspective here? Well, the, in my opinion, the uh, the communists have essentially um, done their very best to kill the spirit of the Chinese people. Um, whatever has arisen since the rise of China of the Chinese Communist Party is something um, somewhat distinct from what came before, not necessarily for the better. Um, you know, they've got great material wealth, but they have a lot of a lot of repression and a lot of human rights violations. And that system is going to be scaled up and propagated to the rest of the world if we don't stop them. And the problem is, is that you know, Eamon Fingleton, who's a libertarian economist, but he was George H.W. Bush's trade representative to China in the 90s. He wrote a book called In the Jaws of the Dragon back in 2008, and he coined a term reverse convergence. Basically, uh, the neoliberal elite in the United States, when when Nixon accepted Mao's opening and opened up the West to China um, and U.S. corporations started flocking over to China for business, Uh, It was done so with this very utopian idea that American business would be the vanguard of opening up China to democracy. Well, the Chinese had another, the Communist Party had another idea. They said, hey, we're going to use America's businesses. um, We're going to use America's businesses to basically uh, they, they called that the, 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 the utopians called that convergence. We're going to force China to converge on the West in democracy. And we're going to use the, the capitalism uh, of our companies to, as the driver. But the Chinese Communist Party said, you know what? Uh, we're going to do reverse convergence. We're going to lure those Western companies here with the promise of wealth. They're going to get so filthy rich. They're not going to want to mess with our political system. And then we're going to use those Western corporations to basically f- as a feedback loop to feed in pro-Chinese sentiment and influence into the countries in the West they're coming from. And that's reverse convergence. And we're going to use Western companies to turn the West into more pro-China rather than the than the reverse. And so that's precisely what the Chinese Communist Party is doing. Uh, and, and they're killing now the spirit of the West as well, as at the same time that they've killed the spirit of the Chinese people. And it is a tragedy um, and, um, you know, I don't know how we stop it short of a full on war and we can't afford a war right now. Um, and it would be very bad for everybody if we had a war. Um, but you know, it, 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 this is the perniciousness of communism. This is why, you know, um, I've long said based on my studies and experience, <clears throat> communism was the most hideous personification of evil we've ever faced. Uh, 
And it didn't really go away when the Soviet Union went away. It just took a new form. And uh, this form, this new form is um, it is much scarier because it is married to an economy that is an the a major component of the world economy without which we cannot um, we cannot survive. And also because um, the, the the Chinese now have this war machine they're building and they have this technological uh, innovation that they simply they simply it makes them very hard to destroy, very hard to defeat. Well, with that said, Brandon Whitechart, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you.